Namaskar. Uh, I'd first like to uh, thank everybody for coming to uh, listen to this. I would also like to thank the organizers uh, at Ashoka University for enabling this evening's conversation, as also my Kosafi students who have prompted many a thought that I'll be sharing this evening. I would also like to thank my family, my parents and my brother, and the enormous support from them, as well as from the domestic help staff here, without whom nothing would be possible. Uh, in many ways, this conversation is also necessary because of them. Uh, since time is always short, uh, even under lockdowns, I intend to speak for about half the time that we have together in order to enable a lively discussion in the other half. I know that each of you has come here with lots of questions and reflections of your own. So I will make a series of unargued assertions, uh, some possibly self-evident, others less so, and include a set of my own questions which strike me as worth asking in this fluid cusp of history. This should hopefully spark the discussion. I'd like to begin by sharing with you a few lines from perhaps last century's greatest poet in the German language, uh, Rainer Maria Rilke. Uh, the poem is from the Duino Elegies, and uh, I just want to show you the lines. Uh, Earth, is it not this that you want, to rise invisibly in us? Is that not your dream, to be invisible one day? Earth, invisible, what is your urgent command, if not transformation? I'll be returning to these lines, and uh, in some ways they provide the uh, the lead motif for uh, this talk. Uh, the corona condition. Without nature, we are not. Rilke, in common with the romantics of a much earlier era, believed that nature was invisible spirit and spirit was invisible nature. It is in this sense that the earth wishes to rise invisibly in us. This is why the end of his ninth elegy has the following line, the excess of being wells up in my heart. But this is not all. Excuse me, I'll just, uh, yeah. But this is not all. It appears that in the process of arising within us, the earth has dreams for us. In a gentle defiance of the European Enlightenment vision, let us seriously consider the possibility that Rilke is right, that perhaps the earth does have dreams for us in the manner that a mother has dreams for her children. And like a mother's dreams for her children, the earth's hopes for us must have power if anything, infinitely more power than the dreams of a mother. If this is true, might we be accursed fools to seek the fulfillment of our own small dreams, when it might be truer to believe that we ourselves are perhaps being dreamt by enormously powerful, mysterious forces, not merely from the belly of the earth, as Rilke's poem suggests, but perhaps as much from the cosmos, which appears to us merely as a benign sky. Might we be part of Brahma's sleep, dreamt by the creator in three dimensions, just so we could occasionally pretend to be God ourselves? Might we ourselves be utterances of the divine, the God gone astray in the flesh, as the French poet Paul Valéry once said of human language? In her uniquely insightful book, uh, The Human Condition, Hannah Arendt observes that from the oneness and wholeness of earth and sky, we have been reduced by a worldview ruled by science to man versus the universe. 
thanks to the scientific revolution since the 17th century, consolidated materially in the industrial revolution from the century that followed, we seem to be held often inadvertently in an antagonistic relationship to the natural world and the cosmos, not excluding our very own, very natural human bodies. We remember the true happiness of our bodies, but occasionally now, surrendering normally to an age of appetites unleashed by galloping markets and their media. It is the cognitive hegemony of this view of the world that the corona condition represents. It is this antagonistic view that the insignificant virus challenges. We have never been more alienated from the earth. As many around the world have divined, the virus is a messenger, a goblin, an imp, who issues a last gentle warning from the gods. There is even a debate among virologists as to whether a virus is dead or alive. To an amateur like myself, it seems like an innocent din denizen from that primitive twilight zone between matter and life about which who can know anything without a powerful electron microscope, if that. For now, the virus rules the street. It has driven all the privileged among us into our digital burrows almost indefinitely, a condition which would have been widely, if not universally, regarded as insane just a month ago. The poor in the hundreds of millions have been squeezed under the global conceptual arm of the lockdown. Some have walked 500 kilometers to reach home in seven days. Others have cycled 2000 kilometers to ride to their village, bribing policemen where they cannot evade them. Yet others have fallen on the way home. Garwapusi is not always pleasant or easy. For so much of the educated segments of the living human race, to try to suspend all of life in order to fight a common enemy, to believe that we are all on the same battlefield and to go after such an insignificant invisible thing like all guns blazing is more a monument to the state of global idiocy, as fearful as it is fearsome, that we have long lived with than a tribute to our knowledge and awareness. Idiocy derives from the Greek idion, referring to that which is exclusively one's own, in contrast to koinon, that which is shared with the whole of humanity and creation. Those trying to privatize the planet may take note. As totalitarian technocracies continue to imagine that they are in control, surely the microorganisms are having a quiet laugh at our expense. Though indigenous and traditional cultures have typically held Mother Earth to be sacred, mainstream modernity is not even accustomed to thinking of the Earth as living, let alone having hopes and dreams for us. We are led to seriously consider the conditions on which life is given to humanity. I say given, since none of us ever asked to be here. If my students' anxieties are any index, this is a question which can no longer be postponed even for a second. It has become ever more urgent to unlearn pride, recognize humility, unlearn knowledge, recognize ignorance, unlearn habit, recognize wonder and miracle. So far as I can tell, these are the moral and aesthetic imperatives of the corona condition. I teach at Ashoka something called ecosophy. I once find my, found myself describing it to a colleague as the truant child of ecology and philosophy, congenitally disloyal to both parents, often absconding from them, listening idly to birds in a meadow, or taking long aimless walks through Himalayan oak forests. It is not scientific enough to draw the regard in which ecology is held, nor is it arcane enough to command the customary respect of philosophy. Sometimes I rather think it is much too simple for someone who has gone through decades of modern education and upbringing. The unlettered, on the other hand, perhaps instinctively, know what I refer to much too well to even be able to articulate it in words. Muscle memory, neural memory, quite enough. In this talk, I follow the Spanish Indian philosopher theologian 
Raimond Panikar, Raimondo Panikar, he also goes by, who very gently and gracefully defines ecosophy as the wisdom of the earth. He carefully clarifies that it is the earth's wisdom of which man is the interpreter. Man is only the interpreter more than our human wisdom about the earth, for that would be some sort of science. Ecosophy is not a science. He says, we need to listen to the earth and learn from her. Ask the birds of the sky and the lilies of the field and they will teach you, quoting the Bible. Such a quest must have been elusive enough in biblical times. In an age ruled by the church of technology, ever so remote from the living geography of the earth, where the globe's cloud elites wish to build a smarter planet and millions wish to do business at the speed of thought, an enterprise like ecosophy is more likely to perish for fear of highbrow intellectual ridicule. And that is when it finds any room to breathe through the cracks in the vast man-made artifice we inhabit now. Ecosophy looks askance at the metropolitan imagination which accompanies such an artifice. It contemplates the man-made global hardware and software of modernity. It examines closely the enormity of the violent estrangement from nature that the edifice built assiduously and over intelligent century by men and women of genius, what it entails. It tries to study with love the alienation and nihilism which stalks modern consciousness. It explores the hypothesis if this alienation, as to whether this alienation is the consequence of the denial precisely of nature that all humanity seems to be suffering now. However, ecosophy does not stop there. It proceeds to renew its sensuous and spiritual experience of the natural world humanity's origins in it and our inevitable destiny towards it. Most importantly, it seeks the eternal that elusively glances at us through the shadows of time, always dancing in the midst of nature and the cosmos. This is what Panika refers to as the divine dimension of human experience in the absence of which he believes it impossible for any environmentalism to be adequate to the challenge of the ever-growing planetary ecological crisis that has faced all humanity for much more than a generation now, threatening to draw us into the abyss of the future, into terminal climate chaos, unless. Up until a month ago, the juggernaut of globally structured greed, of which mortal fear and terror must be the inevitable concomitant in human consciousness, was continuing its accelerating journey after the scare of the great financial crash of 2008. And then the virus struck. The highest authorities have warned that the GDP in the wealthiest nations on earth may collapse by up to a quarter to one half this year, unemployment rising to upwards of 20 to 25%. It is being referred to as a greater depression. The biggest ever, notice they don't say the greatest depression because there might be worse in the future. The biggest ever slump in the history of industrial societies over the last quarter of a millennium. A few days back, the ILO reported that 400 million Indians could fall back into poverty this year. In other words, all the gains in the reduction of poverty from a generation of globalization could be entirely wiped out this year itself. Especially if farmers lose the motivation to harvest the grain. The virus has given us pause, albeit a terribly uneasy one. It is succeeding in doing what those of us involved with education so often fail to do, making everyone think. The skies are falling. How are we to live now? Before we think of getting out of the ditch, we must ask, how did we get here? How could we ever be led to believe, as virtually all modern political thought holds, that humanity could ever find its freedom and joy independent of nature in the first place? Who can live with 
without trees and animals, mountains and oceans. Not just materially, but ethically, aesthetically, existentially, what sense would life make in the absence of these things? The logic of extermination and elimination leads to that. There are deep material roots to the ecological crisis. Ecosophy does not ignore them. It only tries to correct the imbalance by drawing simultaneous attention to the cognitive roots of the crisis. After all, every one of us bases our lives on a certain view of the world. That's how we make a living. It is then crucial to critically scrutinize and dissect it when it is so evidently falling apart from all sides. Intellectual modernity owes its early lineage to three key 17th century thinkers who predate the European Enlightenment. The grandfather of modern science, Francis Bacon, spoke of the conquest of nature. He also spoke of binding her to our service of making her our slave. To be fair to Bacon, he also said, in order to command nature, you first have to obey her. Right? which is why he's thought of so highly in the history of science. The father of modern philosophy, René Descartes, promised that using modern scientific methods of investigation, we will one day become the lords and possessors of nature. You can see that utilitarian aggression wasn't born yesterday. It's at least three to four centuries old. And perhaps most ironically, Thomas Hobbes, cast a dark cloud of suspicion, not merely on nature, but also on human nature, when he said that in a state of nature, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, unquote. Wonder what our Adivasis or the Amazon communities would have to say about that. Uh, it's worth reading Melville when he's talking about uh, the tribes he meets in the South Sea, especially the Thai people. Uh, the two kinds of people he claims, societies who uh, build excellent prison systems and correctional facilities and cultures which don't need them. Uh, more on Hobbes. Uh, for Hobbes, the state of nature would inevitably become a state of war or even a war of all against all. To prevent such an inevitable catastrophe, Hobbes argued for an artificial monster that he called Leviathan, which would ensure order in an otherwise chaotic universe. These are the anxious origins of the modern state. Not coincidentally, Hobbes wrote Leviathan just after the English Civil War in the 17th century. The enormous irony, Hobbesian bad faith should be, the enormous irony of Hobbesian bad faith should be noted given what a war of all against all has been unleashed precisely in a world of very powerful states. States have never been so powerful. Is this war because of the state or despite it? Question well worth asking. How far all this is from a culture which should have been heir to the eternal values of Vasudeva Kutumbakam? The world is one family. We can now see why neither Gandhiji's Hinswaraj nor Rabindranath's sadhana are taught in our schools and colleges. The colonization of the mind must be sustained for the ruthless forces of competitive industrial modernity to be acceptable to a human society. Ideas like Vasudeva Kutumbakam are too dangerous, especially for today's rapidly modernizing Hindus. What is true for individuals is as true of societies. A serious crisis reveals us. While some risk life and limb to heal the sick, others spend precious time seeking the racial or religious origins of the virus. What we need to know is that the sickness outside is merely a mirror of the sickness within. If our hearts are barbarized and our diets are corrupted and we go poking around remote ecosystems with our battery operated equipment, not even letting the seabed rest in peace, should we be surprised if mother nature releases strange new pathogens from the era of the dinosaurs to defend the primeval aquatic life of the oceans? 
ग्रीड इज द ओरिजिनल टायरेंट लालच बुरी बला है आजकल वही एक बला बची है ग्रीड इज द ओरिजिनल टायरेंट द इनर टर्माइट व्हिच डिस्ट्रॉयज द सिविलाइजेशन फ्रॉम विद इन यू नीडंट अटैक इट फ्रॉम आउटसाइड इट ब्रीड्स अ टेरिबल रेस्टलेसनेस व्हिच द एनवायरमेंटल राइटर एलिजाबेथ कोलबर्ट हैज कॉल्ड फाउस्टियन रेस्टलेसनेस टुडे इट्स प्राइम व्हीकल इज द इनएस्केपेबल स्मार्टफोन It is exactly one month today since the WHO declared a global pandemic. The world has been unveiled for us in this short time, a view not normally available. The curtains have parted ever so briefly to reveal the nature of human reality around the world. We do not know how long they shall remain parted and we must make skillful and opportune use of this opportunity to learn all we can about what we have been living. about what we have been asked and made to live for a very long time stretching back at least a generation to the dawn of digitized globalization even now we are slow to learn is this a war to a permanently militarized imagination it seems that fear is a much more available source of motivation than love or compassion or fraternity Modern consciousness is ever primed for war, especially in the recent digital era. Of one thing, I am sure: if we think of this as a war, we are bound to ultimately lose it. For this is neither the first nor the last of the devastating crises that global modernity will face. If you disagree with me, I will gift you a copy of Melville's Moby Dick. Let us be absolutely clear that war is not the way to peace. this is a truism a child understands and an adult forgets there is no way to peace peace is the way and it is the way to health as much for each of us as for our beloved earth mother earth is our only home are we ready to abandon her for the greener pastures of another planet that the space fantasists never fail to promise us everyone knows that time is running out for us the corona moment is perhaps our last reasonable opportunity as a species a window of opportunity before we are permanently locked out what we will do and more importantly unlearn and undo in the next few years will decide our species destiny whether we will rise to the occasion and abandon fear for love or sink forever like evolutionary mutants into the sea of oblivion I I remember thinking the same thought on the evening of 9/11. If Rilke was alive today, would he not ask the earth, "What is your urgent command if not transformation?" I'll repeat that it's the last line of the ninth of the Duino elegies. "What is your urgent command if not transformation?" is the question Rilke asks the earth. The best one can do at a fierce moment of civilizational trial like this is to remind ourselves of the old virtues, the oldest of old virtues and verities: faith and patience, kindness and compassion, forbearance and truthfulness. For which it is not necessary to know the truth; it is only important that we do not lie, do not cheat, do not deceive, do not deny. Raymond Panikkar counselled. the greek patience of metanoia metanoia is a profound feeling of regret and atonement tantamount to a radical change of heart a spiritual revolution among friends one finds the courage to renew one's deepest commitments and refresh ancient hopes i end this talk with that confidence thank you um thank you professor uh i'm going to let a small moment for us to uh sink that in uh for all of you who are listening in welcome and uh you're watching minds firms uh session 2 with professor asim who teaches uh indian ecosophy and global ecosophy at the yif in ashoka university uh today he was speaking on the theme uh the ecosophical condition in the times of the virus and uh 
we thank the team of Mindsperm, who are uh, some of the fellows of YIF's 19 batch, for bringing us this opportunity to connect with a Seam Cert um, at a time like this. Sir, um, I think it would take a little more than just a minute to, uh, or even a day to get over the amount of content you have given us and presented with us. Uh, at least to say that it was a little um, uh, shocking, but we will have to answer some questions, hopefully while we have time with you. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, engage in some questions now. Um, the first category will deal with our uh, relationship with Mother Nature. And uh, so there's a belief that we're living in a apparently scientific and technological so society, yet our response to the pandemic has been extremely er er erratic um, given our economic and political institutions. Is this um, a faltering, a part of imperfect application of science and technology, or is it that uh, our concept of science and technology itself is wrong? I'll be brief because uh, this is a huge question. Um, if science and technology could be applied more perfectly, we would disappear tomorrow. Uh, William Blake in The Proverbs of Hell talks about art being the tree of life, science being the tree of death. Uh, he mocks at Newton, Voltaire, some of the biggest names in Western science and philosophy. And I think behind that, uh, that uh, enormous uh, creation, Proverbs of Hell, is this intuitive understanding that uh, no matter what place science might have, and this I'm now speaking for myself, uh, no matter what place science has in the overall scheme of uh, things in human society, technology is another matter. Uh, very briefly, uh, technology is made up of two Greek words, techne and logos. So if you deconstruct technology, it goes back to ancient Greece, techne. Techne refers to uh, uh, the arts, not in the modern sense, but in the ancient sense, which is to say uh, ways of making things, what modern man would call, or modern philosophy would call homo faber. Okay, arts and crafts and so on. And logos uh, refers to uh, um, uh, knowledge uh, through the word, through language and so on. And the important uh, connection here between techne and logos needs to be understood because while all societies have techne, not all societies have technology. Right. So when you systematize techne through the application of ever more abstract principles, uh, through the application of ever more abstract knowledge is when you get technology. I mean, today things have reached the point and not just today, but for at least 100 years, things have reached the point where uh, we are not just doing natural science, we are doing what Hannah Arendt calls universal science. We are uh, absorbing, our scientists are absorbing learning from the universe and applying some of that right here on earth. Okay? Processes which are foreign to the natural environment on earth, processes like the reaction of fusion, which goes on on the sun, are imported now on earth and you're treating the earth like a laboratory. In other words, you're making what the philosophers before modernity used to refer to seriously as a category error, okay? The earth is not a laboratory. The laboratory should be a subset of the earth and not a superset. So uh, the problem has gone too far and I, I can't do justice to it in a short answer, but uh, science has its place. We know that, okay? Technology is not inevitable. The path of technology is certainly not inevitable. 
even if you know how to create a fusion reaction, you don't have to build a hydrogen bomb. There's nothing good about the hydrogen bomb. It's an evil invention. It's a monument to human cowardice. That's what the hydrogen bomb represents. It's a tribute to the greatest of our fears. Instead of facing our fears, we go and build bombs. So we are not in charge here. We have let loose processes on earth, which have now started taking over. And if we are not watchful, this Promethean punishment that humanity has been suffering for a hundred years at least, will not only continue, but in the end finish us off. And there's hubris behind this. So that's my short answer. A long answer will take some weeks. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, sir. Um, a lot of people have the belief that during this lockdown period, uh, Mother Nature has, as they say, has gotten an opportunity to heal herself. Uh, what is your take on that? And would that mean encouraging more lockdowns to create more opportunities? Well, I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's quite delightful. I mean, the other day, uh, I'm staying with my parents these days, and they have a wonderful terrace garden upstairs. And uh, I walk for one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening every day. And during my morning walk, uh, just three days ago, I saw a dancing peacock on the terrace. Now, this has not happened for 15, 20 years, my mother tells me. Um, uh, but, you know, clearly uh, these are signs which are very precious. But we should interpret these signs with a great deal of care, which is to say, not get carried away by them. So, like I was saying earlier in my talk, uh, the curtain has lifted briefly to reveal the nature of human reality and to reveal the nature of ecological reality with which we come into contact. I mean, for God's sake, animals have sentience, animals have intelligence, animals have a certain consciousness. They, they, they're not like as stupid as us, but they have a certain consciousness. Uh, so animals for sure can tell that they are freer as a consequence. Pangolins for sure can tell that they're better off. Uh, Delhi street dogs, I'm not so sure, but then, you know, Delhi street dogs are Delhi street dogs. They're more Delhi than dogs. I don't know how to put it, but, uh, you know, when we have created a, a metropolitan ecosystem in which animals start behaving like humans, uh, who do we blame? Uh, so there's, there's an issue there. But I mean, don't get me wrong. I, my sympathies are always with the, with the animal kingdom, including the street dogs. So yes, this is definitely a, a wonderful view of what the world could be like if we behave properly. What the world is already like when out of sheer terror uh, instigated by an insignificant entity, uh, we are being made to behave. Mm -hmm. So imagine what all we could do if this awareness could become a global ecological revolution. There is no other way now, I'm absolutely convinced of this, there's no other way to set things right except to argue globally for an ecological revolution to put the industrial revolution in its place. Industry is required, I'm not against industry. Industry has its place just like science does. But if it does not know its limits and if it tries to supply uh, human desires without limit, in other words, continue the cardinal error of modernity, misreading the infinite. You know, whether it's Virat Kohli or Mahinder Singh Dhoni, they're always selling you the limitless through the TV screen. Has anybody found it that way? You won't. Uh, it's, it's a con. It's a con from the start. And they know it, and you know it, and yet everybody is trapped in this uh, mind warp. So this mind warp and this mind war has to end. Uh, just for human survival, I'm saying, uh, this, this whole way of life, this whole way of thought must perish. Mm. Uh, so we must know uh, what the implications are. Uh, if we want to see the earth heal and the birds fly in freedom again, and if we want to enjoy their singing every morning the way our grandparents and our ancestors used to, then 
you know, we must be willing to sacrifice our idiotic short-term pleasures. And the idiot box is the idiot box for a reason. So why do we worship it? Um, sir, uh, a lot of people are asking if any likeliness after this tragedy that countries usually would um, invest in, say, military and uh, getting their defenses back in place. So is it possible for them to actually invest in a solution globally for uh, economic policies, I mean, environmental policies? Is it likely or is it possible? What is the question? Is it likely? Is there any country that you see going that way? I mean, look, I mean, countries have been practicing, uh, you know, sane policies uh, for a while. Uh, uh, you know, you don't have to agree with everything that Fidel Castro stood for. I certainly don't. And he was a dictator in so many ways. However, he did leave behind a, a health system which can be of some use to Italy in this uh, mortal crisis, isn't it? So it was always possible to do good things. Uh, it remains possible. A Christ-like life is always possible. All these things are possible. How likely is it? I wouldn't like to presume to answer that question. So much depends on how we act, what we do, not only now, but what happens after the lockdown ends. Are we going to be like children leaving a, a school they do not like? Or are we going to take pause, continue this pause, extend the window, continue okay. a certain restraint, a certain maturity. This is our last chance to grow up. You see, if you want to turn a whole mass of humanity from human beings to consumers, there's only one way, one and only one way. You have to infantilize them. You have to make 70 and 80 year olds behave like seven and 80 year olds. Otherwise mm -hmm. you can't have endless consumption when the stomach is finite, right? So uh, endless consumption is driven by endless production, unlike what people think. Uh, the common propaganda around the world is that we are very greedy as consumers and we demand, so don't blame us manufacturers and producers. Sorry, wrong number. That's not the way it works. The way it works is you make a huge investment which can easily turn into a white elephant as you see so many, you know, semi-dead white elephants all around you nowadays in this lockdown world. Uh, it can easily turn into a white elephant unless you also create the parallel demand. So you have investor guarantees, you have all sorts of promises that the state must make. The state must be the last resort, the bailout uh, agent. Now the state is the least productive entity in society. How is it gonna bail out the most productive entities? Mm -hmm. By stealing our money, which is what the US has been doing all along within its borders and outside, and it's teaching the world to do the same. So uh, if I was to be a pure cynic, I would say it's impossible that people are gonna behave after the lockdown the way they have been behaving during the lockdown, including the states and the corporations. But I'm not going to be a cynic and I'm not going to be a Panglossian optimist either. I'm going to watch and see what people are capable of. I mean, we are capable of heaven and hell and we should know that. And we should also know that heaven and hell are not places but experiences. Okay. And uh, we are aware, we should be aware of these experiences, even if we are not the agent who creates the experience. Um, so at this uh, period of lockdown and uh, a lot of cognitive dissonance, uh, we draw a lot of optimism from uh, Mother Nature, who has always been a lot kinder uh, rather than harsher in the way that we've been told. So what can we learn uh, from Mother Nature and how to be? You're asking the wrong person because I've never really lived with Mother Nature. You should ask people who know nature infinitely better than I do, which is to say Adivasis, indigenous communities, people who know. I mean, there are women in this country who know every blade of grass and every leaf on every tree in the forest in which they live. 
Uh, a few years back, uh, my friend Bharat Mansata, who's perhaps listening in here, he invited us to Vanwadi, uh, his uh, forest, uh, not his, but a forest which he and his friends have uh, sort of regrown or rather allowed to regenerate over many years, many decades. And uh, uh, there was this lady who was uh, 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 an Adivasi uh, woman from that area, Ambi Devi, and she took some 20 highly educated idiots like myself around the place. Uh, and uh, she walked us for about three to four hours. There would be at least 10 PhDs out of 20 people in that group, right? And she would just, she had a little uh, uh, knife, not a Swiss knife because she's not so wealthy, uh, but a simple uh, sort of a kitchen knife and she would just take off the bark of a tree and say, ye khake dekho, ye meetha hai, isse pila khatam ho jata hai, etc. She went on and on like this with every tree, everything that we were encountering and we were the ones feeling completely illiterate. Uh, thank you, Thomas Babington Macaulay. Uh, that's what you have achieved. Uh, this is what you wanted to achieve. So, she, you know, somebody like Ambi Devi would know seven, eight hundred herbs. God knows, you know, when the drug and pharma multinationals, they come to India or any part of the tropical world where there still are rainforests and so on. They don't go consulting with Amartya Sen or MS Swaminathan. They will go straight to these women who in an unguarded moment will share a secret and then they go and test that herb in their lab in Delaware and they find out uh, the old woman is right even though she doesn't read a single letter in the alphabet. So much for literacy and so much for the school ecological literacy of my profession of economists uh, oh. and others. So, uh, you know, like I said, I'm not the person to learn from if you're, I haven't given birth to a baby. Uh, speak to people who have. Uh, I haven't uh, milked a cattle, uh, you know, milked a cow. Uh, speak to people who have. Uh, so I can only offer my incompetent humility uh, when it comes to learning from mother nature. All I know is that it, had it not been for people like Ambi Devi and millions of other people like that, we will not be here. The ecology of our lives involves them. If you starve them, and if you allow people on the front line of the war with nature, if you allow them to perish, watch out, your time is coming. William Blake again, since uh, I'm too fond of quoting him, uh, a dog starved at the master's gate predicts the ruin of the state. Uh, so that's our future if we ignore uh, the Adivasis and tribals of this country, or if uh, the, 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 the people running Brazil, uh, you know, burn the Amazon. Mm. So that's, that's the way I would see it, yeah. But unfortunately, we've seen that uh, the pandemic has left um, exactly such people actually out on the roads and having to face harsher com uh, conditions than us who can uh, pay for much more privilege in their life. So what can we as a community mobilize to um, at this point in crisis and after uh, action towards help, making a better relation for the future? See, given where you and I are and people like us are, uh, I think, you know, I mean, Look, I don't have any ideology, not at my age. I'm too disillusioned with all modern politics to still have romantic ideas about ideology. Ideologies have only led to uh, you know, wars, revolutions, which have turned into dictatorships, uh, constant uh, backbiting and uh, name calling in normal times and so on. Uh, but I do pay attention to facts as much as possible. I don't know the truth, but I do think that facts can help in finding truth. Mm -hmm. However, in a world which celebrates and enjoys disruptions, fake news, and other perversities, 
I think our duty as somewhat lettered people, notice I'm not saying educated people, as somewhat lettered people with resources and contacts and networks, our duty is to grow the awareness and the general level of education among the educated. You don't need to educate the rest. I think they, their lives have taught them enough. It's we who have to do the unlearning and it's we have, who have to grow the awareness and it's we who have to mature in some ways. And that's where I think we do have a role and that's why we're having this conversation, I think. So when it comes to mobilizing people and so on, I don't see it as my role. I see my role differently. Maybe others who are better organizers and uh, who are political animals in some sense, people like my co-author Ashish Kothari, uh, they can do that. Uh, and I think it's necessary. Uh, I do not believe in the notion of mobilization as traditionally understood. Um, but that's me, and I have my eccentricities. Um, so a lot of talk has come about uh, immunity and uh, a lot of um, evidence and theories were shared for the public uh, so that they can get immune overnight. But that is a process that we build um, long before and cannot be achieved overnight. So could you help us with a few tools that could help us with our internal preparation? Well, they say Rome was not built in a day. Rome can be destroyed in a day, but it can't be built in a day. All good things take time. Immunity can't be developed overnight. It's pretty obvious, and I think children also know this. So, uh, you know, I mean, as an amateur uh, in the area, because I'm not a scientist or a specialist or a doctor or something, uh, except a doctor of the wrong kind, I suppose. Uh, as an amateur, all I will say, learning from my own life and the lives of others I've observed closely, is that, uh, you know, you need to do little things every day. You know, we are the sort of species who rarely get a chance to make a huge blunder. We are not that powerful. We can't destroy the earth, for instance. Uh, but what appears like a big blunder is often a series of small mistakes we've made over a long period of time, which leads to a climactic moment of truth in which we are revealed as blundering idiots or fools. That happens a lot. Uh, so when it comes to habits, one has to be careful. If you don't you know, get good sleep, if you don't sleep at the right time, if you don't eat properly when you can eat properly, uh, if you don't get enough exercise when you can, uh, all these things matter. And these are the only ways. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, but these are things to know here, you know, not here. You know? Oh. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a person to, you know, be able to tell you more than this. I'll just sure. tell you what, you know. So a quick follow-up to uh, this question was that a lot of people came up with an increased anxiety that their home was becoming their workspace um, because of the sudden <laughs> shift. And increasingly, uh, they find themselves even faster than when they were actually outside. So has this fastness and slowness and work home got to do, um, and how would it impact us? It's got to do with business at the speed of thought. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, long before the lockdown idea descended on the human mind, uh, the whole universe had turned into an office already. Didn't people notice when the internet took off? You know, first you go five miles under the earth looking for coal and oil, okay? You murder all the fish along the way, etc. It doesn't matter. You lay down these massive optic fiber cables so that we can have instantaneous communication across the continents. I mean, God forbid if they find the technology to merge all the continents one day and they will try to make Gondwana land again or something. God knows. 
Jambu Dweep or some other Hindu or Islamic fantasy will take over. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the I lost my train of thought. Um, Sushmita, just remind me what you were talking about. We were talking about the pace of the world and how oh, the universe... Right, right. Sorry. Yeah. So the whole world had already turned into an office long before the lockdowns. Hmm. Now the truth has come home, literally. In an age which has no sense of irony, ironies will abound. Paradoxes hmm. will abound. In an age which takes everything literally, uh, where only those characters which are understood in Schmidt's Google are understood to be real things, uh, these things will happen. You know, this uh, digitization has also meant a universal idiotization of the species at another level. Uh, not at the level of cleverness and strategy and outdoing your competitors. That's where we are very good. Uh, but when it comes to uh, living without boxes, uh, uh, thinking on living outside boxes, we have no idea how to do that. So uh, it's a good opportunity, this lockdown uh, uh, retreat or, uh, you know, uh, the lockdown escape is a good opportunity for us to study ourselves, to study our inner habits and to learn something about our inner cognition. And dare I say, you know, uh, look for the God within you, you know, uh, because there is one and it's got nothing to do with your ego. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people would be uh, riled up with the word God, but we'll come to that a little bit later, maybe. Um, okay, goddess, uh, would goddess be fine? <laughs> I'm still not okay, sure. Okay. Would truth be fine? Truth with a capital T. Uh, for that, they'll have to understand. Okay, okay. so you know, I can, I can, I can speak to Descartes as well. I don't have any issues. Um, so, sir, uh, some queries have come in about how uh, the restrictions on travel and the effect of globalization, uh, trade, commerce, just uh, people moving about will be affected, and how policies uh, around the boundaries will get uh, more strict. Um, how would we address that, that people would stay where they are and what would that mean? It would be a damn good thing if more people would stay where they are and don't move around too much. Remember what Gandhiji says in Hinswaraj or somewhere else that, you know, God has given us these two feet to walk. So I mentioned, uh, you know, some stories in my talk about people walking 500 kilometers home or 2000 kilometers of cycling home. Yeah, uh, it would not be such a bad thing if uh, movement was a bit restricted around the world, although for good reasons, not for the reasons Bill Gates has in mind, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I don't want uh, under the skin surveillance and other such nonsense interfering with my freedom. Uh, I don't want it to be interfering with anybody's freedom. Uh, freedom of movement is basic to humanity and uh, I think it should be completely allowed. I mean, liberty is that, freedom of movement and association. It's there in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. It's in other you know, classic books of economics as well. So uh, movement is a wonderful thing. Restlessness is not a wonderful thing, okay? If I have the money, should I type and look for the best soccer game in the world this week and buy a private jet to take me there, buy a ticket, buy a spot on a private jet to take me there. Uh, should that be encouraged? And then one day, given that we are all Democrats when it comes to consumption, shouldn't we let everybody do that? You know, and so on. So when C.D. Gopinath, who was the uh, CEO of Air Deccan when the, the, the planes were still flying and that airline was still flying, he wrote in an editorial I read on a flight once in my days of airline activism, uh, when he says, uh, my goal is to make every Indian fly. 
it seems right now the goal seems to be to make every Indian walk. <laughs> you know? So uh, I think that uh, there are very interesting questions which this predicament poses about movement and how much is good or rather what kind of movement is good. For instance, for long I've believed travel is no longer possible. Only tourism is possible, mm. right? In order to get back to the days of travel, we perhaps will have to go back to clipper shipping, sailboats, you know? And we can enjoy the romance and adventure of a Columbus or a Vasco or a Magellan or somebody, you know? Uh, so uh, I think that, you know, a certain kind of globalization when it comes to the labor market and when it comes to uh, free movement of people around the world has already come to an end. Mm. I do not believe the global market is going to resume the way it was before coronavirus. Nope, it's not going to happen. A different form of globalization might be upon us, will be upon us, yes. But Local not, global. Not the, not the other kind of globalization which we got used to. Um, I see that you had a, a relating comment to uh, Harari Sir's work about the rise of authoritarianism in a period like this. Um, but quickly brushing upon that, um, any closing comments that you could probably wrap around uh, the session and just bring us to not thinking as this as a problem because that would put us into a solution oriented mind frame because I think that is uh, an all encapsulating question that this is the problem and we need to find solutions. Right. So uh, my students are aware of my uh, concern about solutionism mm. because solutionism is the obverse of denialism. Uh, it's a refusal to examine the roots of a disease. It's a symptomatic solution, you know, uh, approach. And a solution is usually a symptom of the same disease which it is trying to cure. Uh, what counts as a solution is when something becomes marketable and profit worthy, and then it's accepted, right? So since profit is our ruling religion in the world at the moment, uh, that counts as a solution. Now, unfortunately, after the Corona crisis, I almost hesitate saying after because I don't know when that moment will come or if that moment will come. Uh, but after the crisis, um, the big danger would be the offering of totalitarianism as the primary political solutionism of our time, right? And everybody just in order to feel safe and secure. I mean, every day I get 20 mails asking me to be safe. I mean, when was I ever unsafe? Anyway, uh, so, uh, you know, to, to capitalize on the human need for safety and security, uh, the state around the world is inevitably going to move in the totalitarian direction. One thing you must know about states anywhere, they're not moral agents. They are ultimately political gluttons. Any opportunity in which they, any opportunity in a moment that they see to grow their political power, they will do that. War can be the health of the state, as someone said. Uh, peace can be the health of the state sometimes, depends on what kind of peace it is, if it suits them. So, um, uh, the state is going to become predictably more authoritarian, totalitarian. I don't think there is any doubt about that. The question for me is something else. Will society continue on its nihilist path? Will consumer nihilism remain the social religion of our time? Because if that is the case, and if insecurity overtakes us, then we will invite every tyrant, every dictator to do the extortion and uh, serve as our uh, guarantors and ultimate peacekeepers. In other words, the thing that causes the problem, you see as the solution. 
I'll end with a line from the Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna. And uh, this is a line which also appeared in an S.D. Burman uh, composition uh, in the film uh, Amar Prem. Now, I can't remember if it was S.T. or R.D., but one of them. Uh, and uh, I'll say it in Hindi first. Uh, he says, um, Chingari koi bharke to savan use bujhaye, savan jo agna lagaye, use kon bujhaye. Right? If there is fire, then there is water to put out the fire. But if fire comes from water, what is there to put it out? Mm. Uh, sir, it looks like uh, more of the followers want to listen and tune in. So we're just going to extend the session just a little bit, if that's all right. Sure, I can go on. <laughs> so, sir, one question that comes up to me is that um, India, for India, the number of cases have not been as drastic. And uh, what has come to light is that the impact it will have on our future as a country or as a nation will be large, a lot uh, more impactful, a lot more greater that worries us right now. Uh, maybe the farmers, maybe uh, uh, how the cities will run, uh, migration. How do we see societies come back that when we are so divided, especially in our context, what is or what are the few ways of uniting forces for us when everyone looks to divide international relations uh, so much can uh, be put against us right now well i think that we have to create spheres of solidarity everywhere and this should be all inclusive and all embracing in the way that gandhiji had laid out you know so, I mean, Ahimsa and Satyagraha were crucial. And these are the only two elements to his philosophy and uh, way of thought and life, which was everything else was derived from these two things. And these, uh, truth and nonviolence, uh, if you stick to those, these two rigorously, throughout, unflinchingly, you will lose all fear. This much I can tell you. Fear will evaporate if you're willing to be truthful and if you're willing to, um, uh, you know, um, commit yourself to nonviolence. Because half our thoughts are violent nowadays, you know. Uh, like I was saying, the sickness outside is a mirror of the sickness within. The lockdown opportunity is an offering from the gods to give us pause to reflect on the possibility that we might be the problem ourselves, that we might not just be a part of the problem, we might be the problem. This pronoun, we, might be the problem. I is too weak by itself, okay? Mobs are born when eyes feel weak. That's when a we is born. That we lives on imaginary strength, which is to say, I rely on my gang to beat up your gang, right? This is the definition of cowardice. People who will never be able to stand alone. People who will never be able to hold on to any truth. They always need truthlessness. They always need fear. They always need power and so on. In this sort of an environment where the mob mind has taken over, not just India, but so many parts of the world and civilization in so many ways is in a process of social decay, you know? How do you arrest this decay? I think what I already said in the talk, which is stick to the ancient, you know, verities and virtues. And I think to rebuild communities, you know, is crucial. Community comes from the word communion. Communion was a spiritual religious notion. When Mrs. Thatcher stands up there in Britain and wins three elections on the slogan, there is no such thing as society. You know, you have to wonder the confidence of this nihilism, you know, where does it come from? What is it about modernity that creates the dynamic of that sort of political nihilism, you know? Uh, but don't just stop at the intellectual bit. 
you know, we have to probe deeper into our, the substance of our being, our spirit, our hearts. Why are our hearts so muddy, you know? If one can understand oneself, I'm convinced one will understand everybody else. I don't understand myself fully. Most people don't. And I think that's where a large part of the problem lies because we separate ourselves from that which we look upon as a problem. And then we look around as for a solution to that without changing much in here. And I'm afraid, I mean, we can't go on living like this eternally. No, uh, it'll have to go. A lot of this will have to simply go. If you don't want nature to send storms and cyclones and earthquakes your way, you just batter the hell out of modernity as though it was children's Lego toys, you know? Uh, we'll have to live in a way which is, you know, materially a lot humbler, but spiritually and emotionally and uh, intellectually incredibly richer. And that's all I know is possible if we read the infinite right. If we read the infinite wrong, God help us. And even God may not be able to. Um, right, sir. And... Uh... Speaking of what helps us during these times, I think a lot of people have uh, looked upon for art as a source of in inspiration, motivation, and a, a set of guidance. Um, and your work also reflects a lot of um, the wisdom of Rabindranath Tagore. Um, would you quickly be able to say a few things about his work and what we could refer to during this time and how maybe art has a role to play? Yeah, well, uh, I quoted William Blake to you earlier, art is the yeah. tree of life, science is the tree of death. Please don't uh, believe what I say. Please read for yourself. Please inquire for yourself. Uh, Tagore, I mean, what do I say about Rabindranath? I mean, uh, I have not read most of Rabindranath till now because my Bengali is not up to speed. Uh, there's a good amount of work which is not translated even now, believe it or not. Uh, but there is enough, there is more than enough in the accessible language which anyone can read if you want to get acquainted with Rabindranath. Uh, since the age of four, I've been singing Janaganuman just like all of you. Uh, since the age of six, I've been hearing stories about Kabliwala and so on, parrots training, so many things. But it wasn't until my 30s that I started reading Rabindranath seriously because Indians love to catch their noses like this, you know. <laughs> so uh, I went through Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and Wittgenstein before I properly discovered Gandhi and Rabindranath. That's the honest to God truth. And I was in my mid thirties by then. Uh, a lot of water had gone under the bridge and the bridge was about to fall. So Rabindranath it was who really rescued me from that predicament, uh, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually. Uh, he was not a perfect human being by any stretch. He knew that very well himself. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is that a life like that was lived and could be lived and can still be lived. That gives me a lot of hope and joy and inspiration. That somebody had the courage. And this is the single most courageous act of Rabindranath's life, which I always mention to you students, to have the courage to quit Macaulay's school at the age of 13 would have taken something in that super, super highbrow, highly educated aristocratic Bengal. And Rabindranath, you must know, came from the first family of Bengal after the British. His family was made by the British in so many ways. So uh, for such a person to drop out of school and uh, simply muse over the birds and the clouds and the Padma River and so on, uh, it would have taken a different kind of confidence. And I truly, truly uh, revel in that, that that is possible. Uh, so I would say, depending on your taste, but in terms of aesthetics, uh, the letters that he wrote from Shilaidaha in East Bengal from his uh, family's estates to his niece Indira Devi, 
those are some of the best uh, writings on the human experience of nature that I have read in any language I know, and I don't know many. Um, beyond that, uh, there's of course the music. I mean, uh, Rabindranath always said, you know, uh, other than Shantini Ketan, you know, people might forget what I wrote here and did there, but my songs might live on. And they do. And so there's any number of uh, wonderfully moving compositions uh, that you don't have to know Bengali uh, to actually feel the, 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 uh, the beauty and joy or the pain and sorrow. Uh, there's so much. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, Shantini Ketan itself uh, is worth a visit, even though it's a ruin today. Uh, simply because you see trees that were planted by Gurudev and they, they are there and they, they, they still give shade and you know, so on. Uh, in terms of uh, the language he wrote in, after the age of 50, Rabindranath writes a lot in English because he realizes the world is now global and uh, you know, he's got the Nobel Prize and by far he's India's most traveled international citizen. I mean, most internationally traveled citizen. In other words, he's India's cultural ambassador. So he takes that responsibility seriously. And uh, he writes so many wonderful things between 1911, 1912, and for the next 20 years. Uh, the lectures he gives on nationalism in the middle of the war, warning every country against it. The, uh, the uh, you know, incredible, a uh, pamphlet he writes with his student Elmhurst in, uh, in Shantiniketan called Robbery of the Soil, which is about the best understanding of town and country relations that I have read. Uh, there is um, his very important lecture to congressmen in 1904 called uh, 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 Swadeshi Samaj. Uh, there is Shaduna, which we study in Indian Ecosophy at Ashoka. Uh, there is the essay Personality. There is his important conversation with Albert Einstein and so on. I mean, it's huge. And sure. uh, most of it is not taught in schools and colleges outside Bengal, so far as I know. Uh, so that kind of brings us to uh, the end of our session. So I think leaving on the thoughts of we still have to work on this decolonization of the mind. We <laughs> thank you very humbly and wholeheartedly for this session that has been so um, gigantic in its value and its contribution. Hopefully we don't dwell on it from here, but let it boil in our systems. And uh, thank you for always being approachable to us in conversation and in spirit and lifting our uh, morale uh, near or far. Uh, well, you lift my morale as well, so thank you. So uh, for all of our listeners and viewers who have had such an amazing session, I would like to bring to uh, you the concluding part of our uh, event today. And you are watching this because of a few um, minds who wanted to continue learning from their uh, experience at YAF and that's how Minds Firm happened. Um, we're going to bring you a lot more content and please do feel free to write to us, reach out to us. Um, we are available on social media. Please follow our Instagram and Facebook pages. Uh, the YouTube links are open source, so this is not uh, to restrict anyone on uh, getting perspectives. Um, we will be doing two sessions a week and we will see you very, very soon for the next one uh, next week. Um, I'm going to take your leave. This was Sushmita on behalf of Minds Firm team. Thank you very much for a wonderful um, session, sir. And for all of you, we have a session with Professor Arun tomorrow. And uh, you, you would have received some mails. We're going to be uploading a lot more uh, information on these pages. So do follow and keep uh, uh, fertilizing your thoughts, I suppose. Thank you so much. Keep safe.